So welcome everybody to our second Saturday's poetry reading. My name is Dan Kerr and I have the privilege of being the Zoom moderator for this program hosted by Kathy Donnelly. We do try to start reasonably promptly around 11 o'clock. Um, if you want to uh, read one of your poems in the open read portion, please avail yourself to the chat function. We will uh, call the people in the names that they appear. And if you're chat challenged, don't worry, we'll, Kathy and I will come around at the end and make sure that everyone who wants to read has an opportunity to read. Please keep your microphone muted out of respect for the other poets. The background music is, uh, background uh, noise can be quite distracting. If you want to applaud the poet, which I'm sure we all uh, enjoy per Herb's poetry, you can do it in two ways. During while he's reading, you can uh, put comments in chat or you can just simply put up your hands and, and chat and, and clap for him. Uh, we do start roughly, as I said, about 11 o'clock. Uh, we, we schedule it to go from 11 to 12. If necessary, depending upon the number of people we have for the open read, we may flex a little bit and go beyond 12, um, but our target is to go from 11 to 12. So I'll get you settled. I'll turn it over to Kathy. Kathy will introduce our, our featured poet uh, this week, this month rather. Then the open read, and I'll call upon people in the order that you're in chat, and I'll call upon you in groups of three, so you'll know to be prepared. We'll call back uh, Herb for an encore. And then Kathy will uh, conclude the program, final reflections, and also announce the poet for November. Kathy's done a great job lining up poets for the next several months. Um, you're not here for evangelization, you're here for poetry, and we're respectful of that. But there are three things that we do at the church which traditionally involve the poets. The poets are quite active in it. One, we have a monthly concert series actually held in the uh, Stanford White Design National Landmark Chapel. And the next group that we have is the Island Chamber Brass. They'll be here on November 11th. It's a group of uh, doctoral students from Stony Brook University. They are fabulous. We do the poetry every month. So there's a picture. One time we did it in the church. You'll recognize the poets there in the picture. Uh, we've been going virtual since the pandemic and we've stayed with virtual and uh, looks like we're going to continue that way for the foreseeable future. But that poetry is once a month. And do know that we do Native American drumming as well uh, once a month. And that's a, a picture of our Native American drummer as well. If you want more information on any of these things, just go to our website or just reach out to me directly. Once a year, we combine our poetry, our music, and our Native American drumming into a very special program, which we call Conversations of the Sacred. This was created by Carmen Bugin. So we have sacred readings and then there, and the sacred readings are all done by the poets. You'll recognize the, the poets there in the picture. And then after each uh, poem, there is a, a sacred poem. There is a musical interlude afterwards as well. Uh, this is the picture taken at the last one we did August 5th. I don't have an exact date, but we will do that. That's now an annual event. So that'll likely be in August of 2024. More information on that one. Uh, it's, uh, I'll let you know when we get closer to that. And we're always looking. Uh, it's it's not a problem to get poets to read. People love to read at this, but I will, you know, assign those spots on a first come first serve basis. So if you have a burning need to be one of the uh, poets, uh, we'd love to have you. Just let me know. And those are the some of the sacred readings we do. We just concluded, and you'll see the picture is different this year. Now somewhere in back of uh, <laughs> of Dr. Bronson is. Uh, is our friend Bruce Johnson. Why he's not in the picture, I don't know, but he's obscured. And Rabbi Fisher will also walk with us here this year. So this is like the sixth or seventh year that we've had the Live Poet Society uh, during this 5K race, 2K walk that we've had them. They're a very active group. And, and uh, Barbara Bianca there added a musical. She came with her drum and created quite a buzz as she went up, she went up Main Street. So, so mark your calendars for that. That'll be uh, next October. Uh, we'll let you know the date's likely to be the first Sunday in October. And what that does is it raises, it, ra it celebrates the role of the church in the community, also raises funds to make the church accessible. Our mission statement meets, we meet people where they are. But as Kathy pointed out, when we used to do the poetry in the church, we had people that uh, couldn't get up the stairs. So we've got a project uh, well underway. We've raised about half the money. We've got a consensus in terms of what the progress, what, what, how we're going to get people in the church, and we're going to add a bathroom uh, to the church as well. So I uh, hope you can join us next October. So without further ado, I'll put my ado aside and turn it over to Kathy. Kathy, the role yours. Kathy, just got to turn your mic on. That helps, doesn't it? So, so I start with a poem. And I start with um, 
a poem about love. It's a love poem of a woman who's lost her husband to Alzheimer's. Um, she met him at a canteen in World War II. Her name was Lynn Cosma. She lived in lived in uh, West Islip and, uh, since the 1950s, 40s, 50s. Remarkable, remarkable poet. Started writing late in life, but one of the best. Studied with Elaine Preston, for anyone who knows her, who teaches at Suffolk County. Still still does, I believe. And, um, and this poem is, her name is Lynn Cosma. And this poem is called About Love. <clears throat> I decided to love him the moment he appeared. He held out his arms. I walked in. So began a love that lasted 50 years. Now he has disappeared, but still I feel his arms around me, the way he would take my cold hands in winter, warming them with his breath, tuck them into his pocket, when he walked in snow, now I learned, I learned, I'm sorry, now I leaned into his shoulder every evening, how he held me at night. One long last look, and he had left. They said forever, but that is not true. I see him every waking hour, walking through the doorways or out in the garden or with me as we strolled down the street to the pond without end amen <laughs> she never wanted to leave her home because she felt she could still see him walking around the bend and she stayed there as long as she could um i would like to now introduce our dear friend herb he's been with us a long time and has read many times in the open and now he is our feature Herb Wallstein earned a BA in English from CA St. U. Fullerton and an MA in English from Columbia U. University, right? He then worked many years as a high school teacher in New York City public schools. He was a finalist in the Yale series of Younger Poet Contest, 1989, Adam and Eve in the 20th century, James Merrill Judge placed third in the Writer's Digest 77th Annual Writing Competition, rhyming category, and has had poems published in the Long Island Quarterly, the Great South Bay Magazine, the Long Islander, the Lyric Magazine, Pomonok Interwoven, Pomonok Transition, Long Island Sounds Anthology, Suffolk County Poet Review, Bard's Annual Forum Quarterly, Bards Against Hunger, 13 Days of Halloween, Poets to Come, The Hands We Hold, A Tree in a Garden of Ashes, Beat Poets Anthology, String Poet, Two Poems Translated from the French, Two Poems Translated from the Spanish, Pratique, a Magazine of Contemporary Writing, and Magic Magazine. So Herb has been very busy writing and publishing. We're proud to have him today. And so welcome Herb. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, actually, I cut down some of that, but that's all right. Anyway, these are poems from my manuscript, Adam and Eve in the 20th Century. And Adam and Eve are people like my late wife and me. And Mary is their innocent child. I'm sure everybody gets the symbolism. By the 1980s, I, had, I wondered what had happened to the idealism of the late 1960s and early 1970s. I was 15 to 20 years old between 1968 and 1973. I was idealistic and optimistic. By 1981, I became very pessimistic. I was then reading Milton's Paradise Lost for a class in Milton. He gave me the idea of the Adam and Eve, not in the paradise I dreamt of in the late 60s, early 70s, but in the real 1980s I was living. I realized that we humans are not and can't be perfect. That's our original sin, imperfection. Mm -hmm. I keep hoping people will at least work harder for a better world for everyone but, unfortunately, we're not perfect. Okay, here's the first poem. Work. It's dark and cold. 
the R from the alarm clock separates Adam from his dreams. He pounces like a panther over his trying-to-sleep wife. In a frenzy, he finds the off switch for the stupid plastic pest. In a daze, he sits upright in his medium-sized bed. It's 4 a.m. He shakes his head like it's been punched. He pulls at his eyelashes, stretches, breathes, then works up the strength to get out of bed. He stayed up too late again. He feels pain from retribution for it. Yesterday, he worked too hard and talked too much again. This morning, he promises himself a break. He thinks, tonight, I'll go to bed early, no matter what happens. <laughs> Swamp cool air drenches the rising moon orange-colored bedroom. He leaves its large window open at night whenever it isn't freezing outside. In Anaheim, the air is almost fresh at night. Almost fresh air helps him better enjoy his few hours of sleep. Sometimes the cold air shakes Eve and him so much they have to cuddle under a thick blanket. He believes that is the only Eden found on Earth. Green. Cars roar from a nearby street. It's a little past rush hour. Not all the people driving by are returning home weary from work but they are all in a great hurry. <clears throat> so, Adam, <clears throat> Adam isn't, oh dear, <clears throat> sorry, had cancer 13 years ago, it still hurts my throat. Green, cars roar from a nearby street. It's a little past rush hour. Not all the people driving by are returning home weary from work but they are all in a great hurry. Adam isn't speculating on the people in each car's story. His only concern is his happiness with not having to outrace and outfight the full streets. Even he are truant from work today, sitting in sequestered green grass, green leaf sun park, watching the sky slowly light from a bright blue to a rich red. Adam turns to Eve and, and says, your apple white and red smile and your apple white and green eyes fill my days in me with great peace, joy, and love. Eve replies, we aren't always full of peace or joy. Of course, we are always full of love, aren't we? Yeah, we're full of it. What I mean is, yes, I love you very much, Adam says softly. Eve smiles. Her cheeks grow redly like the slowly setting sun. Here a scorer. The city seems asleep. He kisses Eve and says that they should take a drive up to the foothills. Adam often dreams of days and ways that were. He grew up with thick woods all round, yet moved five years ago to this too populated and polluted city. While standing up, they turn toward the window. The moon's light drenches the apartment roofs, surrounding their block-long apartment house. Tonight, the foothills must be sparkling like large, dark jewels, Eve smiles. Yes, I'm in the mood for taking an aesthetic country walk beneath the moon. It's a warm winter night in Southern California. Adam closes the drapes and gets his keys. He locks their door, and they're soon riding on the freeway. Eve begins a conversation by saying, There aren't too many people nowadays who think like us, Adam. She pauses, then says, It's too bad 
that on this bright, warm night, most people are at home in front of screens. Adam replies with, many people are afraid to step outside their door. The ones who aren't go to some crowded public place. I'm glad you like when we walk through the foothills. The air is still chaste, and the quiet there really relaxes me. I love the interplay of light and shade up in that great space. With the moon bright like this, it's magical. Emotions seem conjured by Pan's unpredictable spells. The only thoughts that trouble me are thoughts of meeting an angry snake or a human. Old nature and old fate are always factors that are disturbingly inconstant. They can bless or they can kill. Well, I hope we'll enjoy an Epicurean evening. Soon, they're both silent like the ride. They leave the freeway, rolling up old country road. They drive up it until it's dead end. They then park their car on the deserted street. Before them, east, is a wide, weedy plain. To the near right are fine suburban homes. Near left are aromatic orange groves. In the far southeast is a gully with a fair-sized creek and eucalyptus trees. To the northeast is where they want to walk. There wanders a dark, dirt road beneath homes that resemble palaces. Unlike those small one-story houses in the flats, these standing here soar three stories high. They have bay windows and pseudo-spires. They are all built too closely together in the typical way that it's done in Southern California. The dirt road inclines by slow degrees. Suddenly, a galaxy of city lights ascends into the startled viewer's vision. Near that point lies a small hill. Adam and Eve intend to climb it. They process along the dirt road like two muses on Parnassus. The point at which the city lights leap into view is their first stop. Adam looks up to the pseudo-spires, then farther on toward the vista light that shines through the smog-filled flats. He soon looks up at the full moon. Eve takes a breath of the wind's orange blossom perfume. There is a strong east wind that pushes through the coastal sage scrub plain. Oak limbs groan like arthritic bones. He turns to the small hill. He sees the large back of a taller hill beyond it. That hill has short chaparral and spots where tall pine trees grow. There's a stretch of tiny, verdant valley through those hills. The tiny, verdant valleys very well protected and enclosed. In fact, there's not a single sign of human life around, except the well-worn path that passes through an orange grove and lemon trees. This scene reminds Adam and Eve of other days. Shelter from the Elements The indistinct gray sky merged with cloud-topped right-next-by mountain peaks. Rotund snowflakes, as softly as soft young dove feathers, dropped. While Adam walked around his camper, cakes of snow collected on his boots. He turned, saw Eve and Mary starting to climb out, then exhaled mist. He checked what fires burned. He listened. Silence. Almost thought about when suddenly... He heard Mary, like larks at dawn, shout. Eve called, It's much too cold. Let's build a fire. 
What Adam wanted was to take a walk, but said, okay. He spied some wrens soar higher and witnessed dark clouds like dark angels stalk the conquered sky. That was why he was in the mountains bright and early. Saturday was merely 30 minutes past Matin. It'd been five years since Adam got to play in snow. Five years since he'd last seen a wood's white gray. Impatient, Eve warned, Adam, hurry up and make that fire. Mary might not be too safe in this snow. Adam agreed. Yep, you're right. Still, if we don't stay out too long, she shouldn't have any problem. If you'd build a fire, that'd help, Eve pressed. Go back inside the camper, Adam laughed, walked back, then filled his arms with wood he brought. He guessed, with pride, the wood here would be wet. Glad eyes watched fat flakes glide. An hour later, everything was ready. Even small Mary stood before tall flames. The toddler, Mary, had to be held steady and watched so that her lost-in-wonder games were harmless. Actually, Mary was far too overguarded, but she didn't mind. She loved attention and being a star. Adam looked up. The snow-filled sky was lined with mountain peaks. This is the best way to unwind, he laughed. Yeah, and catch pneumonia, death, or worse, Eve added. Adam asked, come on, where's your romantic love of nature? Just in verse? Regard that carmine cardinal, its pure, rich red, and those blue jays in that pine, more insouciantly blue than a blue sky. And that white rabbit by our neighbor's door, and the sublimity of the nearby white peaks, they sure invite thoughts, feelings, and the eye. Eve pointed out to Happy Adam that those animals are probably near starved and freezing to death. Like a diplomat against all life, the wicked wind can carve its way into the blood and make it hard, as steadfast as death. Adam seconded this. Then he reminded Eve, not all still starved. She sang, yes, you're right. There's pain, there's bliss, and everything between. Like love, give me a kiss. <laughs> Realist. The night sky is as white as a field of snow, and the cars on the street are 5 p.m. slow. Tired Adam knows home smells of diapers, shakes with wild cries from loud kids, fills with smoke from steaks, and is strewn with clothes, dishes, and toys. Then he thinks of Eve, for whom he's worked so hard. I'll see she's worked hard, will be warm, and might fight tonight. But with resolution, he says, that's all right. The Bourbon House Storm. Eve swoops through her door like a wren reaching its nest after foraging for food. Tiny computer numbers, harder to discern than hiding worms, have exhausted her eyes and intellect. Mary hound hops off the couch across the carpet and into her weary wings. Adam's on the couch, splattered with puke from the too loud TV. Dinner's still cooking, he recites. The noise from Mary's mirth and from the TV's tremor keeps Eve's headache until it's hotter than dinner. She'd hoped a high culture evening would calm her county accountant convulsions and ulcer. She turns to turn off the TV, 
But Adam shouts, Wait, Judge Judy's about to clobber these creeps with their verdict. Immediately, Eve flutters to the bathroom, searching shelter from her suburban house storm. Two seconds later, however, little Mary comes to ferret her out. Mommy, Mommy, you've been in there a long, long time. I've got your party. Eve, Mary squeals while kicking the door. Eve now remembers, provides a poor barricade. If my wings weren't so weary, I'd fly out the window and disappear, she sighs. But when I land, everything would be the same, or would it? Adam, late at night, drinking beer and listening to music with his and Eve's mutual friend, who had just separated from his wife and was unscrolling all the flaws she had that brought that about. It made Adam think of Eve. He realized he often would complain about this or that little thing he wished she would do. Then her guardian angel slapped him upside his head. <laughs> that rattled his addled thoughts and feelings into a reality he hadn't seen before. He thought about his failing vision, and it made him see other ways he had failed to see her love and goodness in its entirety. His own better angel had him take paper and pen to unscroll what he hadn't seen even with formerly perfect vision, better than perfect vision. White, mother, lover, worker, lady, friend, you're older, brayer, bones crack when you bend, yet somehow now you're lovelier to me. It's true my eyes aren't what they used to be, but perfect vision never let me see those daily deeds of love that never end. Wife, mother, lover, worker, lady, friend. Okay, is that 20? I think that's about 20 minutes. I timed it. Yeah, that's about right. That's about Did I get it right? right? Good job. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so yeah, I'm, you know, I'm done until the encore, I guess. Okay, we'll bring you back for the encore. We, you know, that was just such a wonderful journey. You know, obviously, as a person of of, of scripture, I'm certainly was kind of the number of times I looked at the story of Adam and Eve, and it's just so interesting as you gave the background and studying Milton and your transformation from being, uh, um, you know, being very optimistic and being idealistic, and then you becoming pessimistic, and you. You see that little tension in the poem throughout that imagery is just just beautiful between you know the the plastic pest and the angry snake and the analogy between eve and the apple and just it was it was quite a journey you took us on her thanks well, really thank you thank right. you so we'll bring back herb on for for an encore and what i'm going to do now is go to the open read and a couple of you i new names that i see here so just so we're all on the same page we do have guidelines for this so Please, we'll, we'll call the names as they appear in chat. Please, uh, one poem and no more than five minutes. Please keep your microphone muted. Please wait to be called upon to read. And I made a mistake here. It's uh, Kathy will close the program, not Richard uh, Bronson, although he's welcome to join us at a future point. And uh, we will flex, but we should be done by around 12 o'clock or so. Okay, so let's go to the open read and we'll call the readers. Um, and I've got some at this point, and there may be some others. <laughs> Marvin, you are the default first reader in honor of your chat challenges. So Marvin, we'll go to you first. We'll go Marvin, then we'll go Don Billings, and then we'll go our friend uh, James from North Carolina. Marvin, over to you. The uh, title is Midship Might. I want you, the teacher said, for the midship might in Pinafore. You're the smallest boy in school. You'll do for Pinafore. I can't sing, I said. I can't even hum a lick. You could stand, she said, and open your mouth like a fish. They won't know you can't sing. 
and we'll teach you what to do. We want you for your height. Just don't grow the next few weeks. Rehearsals start tomorrow after school. See you then, midshipmite. You could do it, my mother said. You play Tiny Tim in third grade. It will look good for college when you apply, Dad said. You were fine as Tiny Tim. Hurrah, hurrah. God bless us, everyone. Wear this jacket and straw hat, Miss Gould, the teacher said. Stand between Gordon and Bruce. They're the tallest in the school, so you'll seem even smaller. You'll look even mightier, she laughed. My friends play ball at four. I'll miss the games, Miss Gould. But you're just right for the midship might. There's no one as small as you. You'll have plenty of time for ball. Without you, pinafore sinks, she laughed. Now raise the flag. That's your job after we sail the ocean blue. Step back, give a salute, and make it snappy. Fall back in line. No, between Gordon and Bruce. Yes, always there. And like a fish, move your mouth. Sing, I mean, don't sing. Hooray, bravo, great show. You were the cutest. You were grand, Mom said. I didn't know you could sing, Dad laughed and winked and laughed. First Tiny Tim and now this. We've got a Mickey Rooney here. Don't grow, boy, not another inch. We'll get an agent, and soon you'll be on your way to Hollywood. People around us were talking, Mom said. Look at that little one. Is he really in high school? Ah, oh, come on, they borrowed him from Franklin Elementary. Yes, they did. But everyone is calling me Mitchell in class at lunch and study hall, even when I'm playing ball in gym. Hey, Mitchell Might, throw it here. Where's your straw hat and your pinafore? I'm branded for life by my height. Mitchell Might, I'll always be. Dead mom, it isn't fair. When will I grow already? Who has to grow? You have it made. Movies, television, the Broadway stage. There'll always be parts for you, said Dad. But Dad, we love you just the way you are, said Mom. Just the way you are. <laughs> Mom, it's beautiful. Amazing how you take us back to your, your life as a child. Just great stuff. Okay, over to Don Billings. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm reading from the Adirondacks. Uh, and this is the first poem I wrote in the Adirondacks. And uh, I guess about a quarter of all the poems I've written were written up here. This is called Morning on Paradox. We come to the water softly crunching, twigs and grasses wet with dew, birds murmuring, startling calls, pierce the silence of the forest gloom, Dawn comes rising pink and rose over the mist of the chilled waters. Dark shadows now scattered by the coming light, scent of the woods in the damp air. Then we're off, gliding, gliding, gliding with soft swishes and the splash of drops from the paddles. There's a chill. I wish I'd worn the sweater. Beyond the bend, a splash and another they know well before we're coming. It's a long way to Dave's spot, far on the east side. Onward we move, gliding, gliding, dark rocks high above, menacing, not yet found by the rising glow. Soft swishes drips from the paddles, ever moving forward through the mist. Across the chilled water, we drift in just off the sleeping rocks, don't they know it's dawn? Swish, the first line flies. A pull at once and the line is moving. The reel sings as he makes his run. I'm still fumbling with my tangled line and wish I'd brought the sweater. Dave has the touch 
with the pickerels in the net dripping, bending to and fro, hoping a way out of this morning's surprise. Dave holds him up a beauty, long and mottled, and with a soft word or two, sends him on his way to the swaying weeds and sunken logs. Over the lake floats a great blue heron, long wings, barely flapping with a fish firmly in his beak, smoke of an early morning fire in the air. The silence mingles with the mist and we drift along in the chilled air, quiet, no words, swish, flip. The gits it hits the surface, racing ripples roll across the water. My thoughts like ripples unseen, yes, I wish I'd worn the sweater. <laughs> this is my friend Dave with the pickerel. Thanks, Mark. I can feel the scent. I can smell the scent of the woods and feel the chill of the air. So wear the sweater next time. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was earlier than six in the morning when we went out, and I was not prepared for the weather. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay, James, down to North Carolina and James, and I understand something about baseball. James. Right, being right in the middle of the baseball season, would have had a lot of nerve, would be with much vibe and verve when he threw a curve. Heard that when at bat, player was chubby and fat, dumber mm -hmm. than a doormat. Player pulled a stunt for a short bat, had to, short bat had to hunt, bragged about his bunt. Possessed a great goal, his hitting would take its toll, make bases, most bases he stole. Around bases stride, home run had hit with much pride, himself was beside. Looked like a lone shark, to his team added a spark, hit ball out of park. Play baseball does love, performance was way above, received golden glove, playing in dispute, team had saved a lot of loot when they had to substitute. <laughs> right on. <laughs> Good Thanks, James. Good. Good stuff. Okay, the next three are Virginia, uh, and then Claude, and then Dan. Uh, Virginia, over to you. And Virginia, you got to remember to turn your mic on. Hi, can you hear me? You are loud and clear. Oh, oh, good. I first, I want to thank Mark uh, for the humor and. Uh, also, Herb, for the happy Adam poems. They were wonderful. Um, the world is such a hellish place right now. And rather than uh, talk about the loss that's going on in the world, I'll talk about the smaller losses closer to home. Cousins ticking away. My cousin Joe died before COVID struck. He was my mother's sister's son. Glad we took him to dinner the year before. He was frail from a rheumatic heart. But still, I was shocked. We had played together in grandfather's house in the 1950s. He would gift us with nylons at Christmas, I and my four sisters. My father acted as Joe's father after his own father's death. Then my husband's cousin, Bill, a tennis and golf player, slim and impulsive, died in front of his family of a stroke. His wife and I corresponded, and she sent pictures of times when they boated to our island. I was startled by our youth. Bill was the son of my husband's mother's brother, whose own father left them and their mother and disappeared, only to return for a brief hello. Barbara, Joe's sister, called me a few times a year, the last I later learned a few days before her fall, which at her age of 88 cracked her hip. I was a bridesmaid at her wedding, an April day when it snowed. We always could talk, and I can hear her soft laugh now. I'm glad Alex and I visited her in New Jersey a few years back, we spent the day with her and John, who still survives her inevitable death. Barbara spent time in a rehabilitation facility, and that was where she contracted pneumonia. I wrote her son, my godchild, my memories of her, some consolation, I hope, for him. My last conversation with Barbara was about my successful search for the family of my great aunt Aroxy. I had found her son, George, a Yale professor of neuropsychology, and her deceased daughter's family. Confirmed by ancestry, I told Barbara. I hope to meet the found cousin of future day. Aroxy's sister, Zarawi, also had children. One, Bob, 20 years my senior, I knew from trips to Cleveland. His death ended my visits. 
Her other son's children still correspond. And from one I learned, George used to borrow tools from my father and that the professor was failing. Another email, George had died, right after our ancestry nod. I spoke to a son of George's sister and learned more about his uncle. My husband and I called his cousin, Jim, a few times a year during COVID. We visited Jim and Jane the summer before COVID, a most enjoyable visit. When we called this past spring, we were invited to Jim's 98th birthday in June. Their son, Dave, the conductor, often at the Met, where we saw him conduct twice, called us in May to give us the sad news. I like Jim. He was intense, energetic, and knew how to make an honest buck. I helped my husband write up his memories of Jim for family, most rambling praise for a cousin 11 years older, expert with cars and business schemes. We went to the funeral home, as we had done with my cousin Joe, and as with Joe, I was astonished at the children and grandchildren unknown. What is known? We have lost lives intricate to our own. We have lost connections of youth. We have lost years off our lives. Beautiful, Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Claude, over to you, and you let me know when you want me to pull up that picture. All right. Well, you can show the picture uh, in about a minute. Let's see. I just want to say, uh, midship might. I can relate. I was the smallest guy in my school, too, in high school. Until another kid came who was like six inches smaller than me. And that uh, Palm Dawn of the canoe ride, and the I guess that was in a canoe, kayak, and the dawn, that was great. And um, let's see. So um, this is about a fellow named Al Weisbacher, who wrote, I think, the best book about surfing ever, In Search of Canton Zero. He also wrote two of the first three Miami Vice shows, for which he got royalties for the rest of his life. And he was a surfer. And the kind of hunter as Thompson County Gonzo writer, too. And um, he used to surf uh, as a nose rider, which 10, or, 10 toes over the nose is the same as hanging 10. Now I can do that all the time. Anyway, so here's two definitions and then the poem. Because it looks like Al died about a week ago, and we're still not sure of details. So this is the version from the beginning. First book report. You know, an RV is a recreational vehicle. And the perspicacious is of acute mental vision or discernment from the Latin of clear-sighted to see-through. Because Alan was that kind of guy. What about Al? We all want to know, is he really dead? Suicide? Or was there foul play? He sentenced to the RV world the lonely old photographer. He was an award-winning photographer. Did he have his dog beside him to comfort him? I can put the other picture up there. there. To comfort him as love denied him? He crazed about the 9-11 planes. Telling me Fossey was no hero before I was ready to pronounce this. Al stopped surfing during COVID. When he left San Blas, trundled over the border, Mexico not allowing him re-entry, he unfortunately forced to wander about the mountain states, shooting sunsets, clouds, waterways, landscapes, animals in nature, using special effects, embellishing his artistry. This morning, it must be five days, Facebook and Gmail contributing nothing to the initial news of his unceremonious departure, dying in South Dakota in an RV camp. What was he thinking? Was he exhausted, choosing his latest pictures to share with his followers? His battery running out, as Donald Trump says? How? Ten toes over the nose, speeding across a blue-green wall. How I will remember him. The cynical visionary scowl. Lenses hanging off his flak jacket. Gumming his cigar. Nicotine and addiction to beat down. Miami Vice. 
Captain Zero, gone. Cosmic Banditos, another book he wrote, stuffed with existential words. Al really a philosopher. Perspicacious, audacious, not prone to swallow. The processed, gorgeous, obvious. Not Al. Thank you, Floyd. Okay, so um, this next poem I've been writing, you know, I have a big head and there's lots of poems in it that are waiting to be read. And I started to write one. And then I got a message from um, the CEO of Deloitte Israel, where I used to work. And I got a message from the CEO of the Deloitte Middle East firm from Lebanon. And I said, I got to read this poem. So this is a poem that appeared in Bard's um, last year's boards, and it's called, and some of you heard it before, but I think it's timely. It's called The Breath of God. And it's about a trip I took to the Holy Land. Here goes, The Breath of God. As we stood together before the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, my Israeli host and friend, Ilan, proudly said, you know, Dan, it all started here. I kept hearing Ilan's words as I visited Masada, Nazareth, the synagogue, at Capernaum, the Sea of Galilee, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Via Della Rosa, and the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Perhaps I heard Elan's words most clearly as I stood before the Dome of the Rock. Here is where Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac. Solomon and Herod built their temples, and the prophet Muhammad ascended Barak, the traditional heavenly steed of the prophets, for his passage to heaven. Father Abraham would no doubt be pleased that the three branches of his family, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, revere this spot so many, many years later. Admiring the simple beauty of the Dome of the Rock, I remembered a time I entered a mosque in Cape Town. As I quietly took off my shoes, an imam seated on the floor beckoned me in. It was the mystical place, and I could feel the breath of God on my neck as I often do when I visit churches, synagogues, and temples around the world. At the funeral of murdered journalist Daniel Pearl, an iman spoke of the shared values of the three Abrahamic faiths. The iman said, if, if to be a Jew means to say with one's, all one's heart, mind, and soul, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Not only today am I a Jew, I've always been one. If to be a Christian means to love that the Lord God and our Lord with, our, with all my heart, mind and soul, and to love your fellow human being, being what I love for myself, then I am not only a Christian, but I've always been one. And I'm here to inform you with the full authority of the Quranic texts and the practices of the prophet Muhammad to say, may Allah's peace, mercy and blessing be upon you is no different. If the three quarreling children of Abraham could find the courage to focus on what they share, their common values and beliefs, perhaps the breath of God they worship would help cool this overheated world. Thank you. Okay, so the next group is, and we'll, we'll get around to those of you who haven't uh, put your name in chat yet. So if you wanna read, put your name in chat. The only other name I have right now will welcome others, and I'm sure Kathy wants to read. But Deborah, over to you. Very pleased to have the Poet Laureate with us. Deborah. Thank you, Dan and Kathy, and thank you, Herb, for that wonderful reading. I really enjoy your retellings of Adam and Eve. We lost Louise Glick yesterday, so I'm going to read a poem by Louise Glick. Um, she is the first poet I ever saw read in person. I saw her read at Stony Brook University many years ago and she was just so elegant and glamorous and I just never forgot what a presence she was on that stage. All Hallows. Even now this landscape is assembling. The hills darken, the oxen sleep in their blue yoke, the fields having been picked clean, the sheaves bound evenly and piled at the roadside among sink foil as the toothed moon rises. This is the barren of harvest 
This is the barrenness of harvest or pestilence and the wife leaning out the window with her hand extended as in payment and the seeds distinct gold calling come here come here little one and the soul creeps out of the tree thank you deborah okay so let me go around and see if we have anyone else who wants to read before i uh, call upon kathy to read i'm gonna put you all in gallery here so uh, anyone who hasn't read yet chu you want to read today she says no so uh and I have someone named Pappas on iPhone, and I've got uh, Carol there as well. Either of you like to read, Carol? I have something, but truthfully, with the situation, I don't know if this is. We have we have no filter. We have no filter. If you've got a okay, poem. okay, because mine is just happy, and the world isn't happy, and I'm not happy, and we did wonderful vigils, and you're remembering people gone, and this is so light. We could use it, go ahead. Okay, love. <laughs> when does friendship turn to love? We enjoyed each other's company. We looked forward to every meeting. We did not have to pretend or be careful with our words. We had a mutual respect for each other. We really listened when the other talked. We, he asked me to go steady and I refused several times until I said yes. He asked me to go to his cousin's wedding, I refused. I did not want his family to think our relationship was serious. He asked me to his college prom and I had a great time. I said yes to the next family wedding. I was young, I was happy at my parents' home and I was surprised when he proposed, but it felt wonderful. And I'm glad I said yes, 58 years since the proposal, 56 years since the wedding. And I know it is really love. Love at the beginning is exciting and new, a new way of sharing, learning to compromise, planning a wedding, finding an apartment, picking out furniture. He and I became us. Two children, four grandchildren, and one grandchild later, love is companionship, love is trust, love is being together, love is giving the other space, love is still sharing and compromising, love is happiness and contentment. He is my best friend and confident. Love is wonderful in a more mature way. Thank you, Carol. That was beautiful. He and um, I became us, just beautiful. Thank you. Okay, so let's go back to the gallery here and see if there's anyone else who wants to read. And Kathy, do you want to read today? Yes, I'd love to. Go ahead. So I just... Um... I have this poem here called Simplicity, and um, it's kind of looking at life through a, a man's point of view, as best as I can do that, a little tricky. And, uh, you know, these poems, um, Adam and Eve in the modern world, um, it's so uh, strange to think of it, you know, on one hand, appreciating the blue jays and the animals herb, but at, at the other time, needing sleep and dealing with freeways and crowded foothills and suburban homes is such a contrast and it's just a reminder of what you you know the garden of eden versus life which is so complicated so this is a maybe human nature to not want things to be so easy even though we strive for it and so this poem i wrote a while ago and um you see what you think simplicity each morning, sun brings light into a room with open curtains, shines through eyelids still shut tight, unmade bed abandoned, its sleepers soap off layers of night. Bread pops from a toaster, coffee percolates, eggs sizzle in a pan, silverware clinks, dishes clack, the sounds of morning. High above the kitchen countertop, a clock counts minutes, setting limits. He looks across the dining table, life partner buried in the New York Times, wonders if the day will be any different from any other. A small ache emerges from a place he cannot point to, longs for something he cannot see. It lingers in commuter traffic, switches lanes, merges, follows him through the parking lot front lobby, 
up the elevator, through the long corridor, to a room that swallows him whole. Letting go of the world outside, life is as simple as you make it, he thinks to himself, or as complicated. Thank you, Kathy. Great addition. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. And I don't think we have any more folks that want to read. I'll take one last peek at the gallery just in case to be all inclusive here. So nope, I don't see any more. So Herb, over to you for your encore. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to end uh, where I began with work. And I, I do want to say, yes, uh, our imperfections uh, con constantly get in the way, unfortunately, and lead to disasters that we're going through now. But anyway, here's work. Like a hungry wren hunting for food and warmth in a cold, snow-filled woods, Adam must work extremely hard or else. He begins his day before the sun and often continues working through nights longer than a night. He must leave his warm bed and warm wife at 4 a.m. Sunday through Sunday. At 4 a.m., it's cold even in Anaheim. Wretchedly, he wrenches himself away from his womb-like bed and emerges into the world. Often, he ponders his life's precariousness. Of course, this has brought many insights. When younger, they frightened him. He'd then bellyache like a baby. Because he's now an adult, he's able to leave peace and warmth with less distraction. Because he isn't an ubermensch, he isn't completely resigned to hunger, cold, or any of life's other unheavenly realities. Frantic phobias are subdued through his ignoring them and not letting himself be bothered by them. To him, that's mature and wise. Of course, he isn't always mature or wise. However, he is rarely hysterical. Still, he likes his warm, womb-like bed much more than the cold, snow-filled woods of the world. Thank you. Well done, Herb. Great encore. Yeah. Okay. So, Kathy, over to you. So, uh, lastly, you know, um, we have a marvelous poet coming next month. Um, I picked him out of a crowd, more or less, because I thought his poet was just wonderful. His name is George Guida. Uh, some of you may know him. Um, and I could read about him, but I'd rather do it next month and just emphasize that it was an honor and privilege to have Herb today. And um, Herb, with having had cancer, you sound fine, clear as a bell. You read nicely, slowly, and carefully, and made your stories of Adam and Eve um, memorable forever. So I thank you for that. Um, and we look forward to George Guida next month. And so see you then. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>